a single sentence can move markets. When Elon said batteries were going to be a massive thing, the internet did what it always does, filled in the blanks with fireworks. Overnight, every forum and feed treated massive like a secret code for new chemistry, five-minute charging, and a car that makes your current one feel ancient. But massive doesn't mean magical. It means scale, cost, and deployment, the boring levers that actually change what's in your driveway. Look at what massive really signals. It hints at cheaper packs rolling off faster lines, chargers showing up in places they didn't exist last year, and energy storage quietly soaking up peak demand, so stations stay fast when you need them. None of that is headline glamorous. All of it makes your life easier. That gap between what sounds epic and what ships is where hype thrives. It's why you see thumbnails promising the end of lithium next summer. It's also why so many viewers end up confused about what's real, what's a lab demo, and what's just a loud guess. We're not here to dunk on optimism. We're here to separate the useful from the theatrical. Here's the filter. If a claim would require rewriting the battery's voltage window, cooling architecture, safety validation, and software in one swoop, it's not a drop-in, it's a program. Programs take years, suppliers, certifications, and money. They leave footprints, permits, purchase orders, service docs, not just hot takes. That's the mindset we'll use for the rest of this video. We'll take the biggest claims and run them through physics, manufacturing reality, and what Tesla has actually put in customers' hands. No drama, no doom, just the signal. Because the real story is compelling on its own. The industry is sprinting toward lower dollars per kilowatt hour, smarter charging curves, and energy storage that keeps the grid from flinching when you plug in. Those gains stack, they compound, and they're the sort of massive that lasts. So before we crown a new chemistry, the lithium stifler, let's get clear on what aluminum ion is, what it promises, and where it really stands today. The difference between a headline and a hardware roadmap is about to matter. Here's the simple version. Aluminum ion uses aluminum to store charge instead of lithium. On paper, it's attractive, Aluminum is abundant, affordable, and each atom can move three electrons, which hints at strong capacity. Many lab cells pair aluminum with a special carbon cathode and an ionic liquid electrolyte. The result is a battery that can take charge quickly, run at a lower cell voltage roughly 1 to 2 volts per cell instead of lithium's higher range, and lean on materials that are widely available. So why isn't it in your driveway yet? Because turning promise into product means solving a lot of unglamorous problems. The electrolytes that make aluminum ion work in the lab can be pricey and tricky to manufacture at scale. The energy density you get today is often lower than mature lithium ion packs, which matters for range and packaging. Cycle life, how many times you can charge and discharge before noticeable fade, still varies widely across research setups. And even if those hurdles were cleared tomorrow, the supply chain for cells, modules, pack assembly, cooling hardware, safety validation, and recycling would still need to be built, tested, and certified. There's also the integration question. A vehicle is engineered around a specific voltage window, thermal behavior, and safety envelope. Swapping chemistries isn't like changing a phone case. It touches the battery management system, the cooling paths, crash structures, software, and warranty strategy. None of that rules aluminum ion out. It just means real deployment would look incremental. Pilots, small fleets, then careful scaling as data proves out cost, performance, and reliability. If you've seen claims of instant long-range miracles or five-minute full charges, keep a healthy filter. Some demos are genuine progress. Many are optimized lab conditions that don't map one-to-one -to, -one to a mass-market car that must last 10 years across heat and cold, potholes, and impatient charging habits. Bottom line, 
Aluminum ion is interesting, evolving, and worth watching, but it's not a confirmed near-term centerpiece for Tesla production cars. To understand what is shaping the next two years, follow what Tesla is actually building and shipping today. If you want a clear view of tomorrow, start with the hardware that's already on the road. Most Teslas today run one of two lithium families, iron-based packs, LFP for affordability and durability, and nickel-based packs, NCA or NCM, where higher energy density matters. LFP shines in cost and longevity, and it's comfortable living at 100% daily charge, great for commuters who don't want to micromanage a battery. Nickel chemistries carry more energy per kilogram, which helps with long-range variants and performance models. Neither is flashy. Both are proven, serviceable, and supported by a global supply chain that actually exists. Layered on top is Tesla's manufacturing play, big castings, and, in select models, the 4680 format with a structural pack. The goal isn't headlines, it's fewer parts, faster assembly, and a tighter integration between body, battery, and cooling. That combination reduces cost per car, stabilizes margins, and gives Tesla room to drop prices or add features without rewriting the bill of materials every quarter. It also means improvements can arrive stepwise, a better cathode blend here, a more efficient cooling plate there, updated charge curves by software over time. Supply flexibility is the quiet superpower. Tesla sources cells from multiple partners while pushing its own lines so it can pivot between chemistries as markets move. If iron gets cheaper, more trims lean LFP. If a density bump is needed for towing or performance, nickel steps in. This isn't a single bet on a miracle breakthrough. It's a portfolio that can shift without pausing production. Why does this matter for 2026? Because cost declines and reliability, not rumor level leaps, decide what shows up in an affordable Tesla. Expect incremental gains, modestly higher energy density, sturdier cycle life, gentler charge taper, smarter thermal control, and wider V4 availability so peak speeds are easier to hit in the real world. Each step is small. Together, they feel like a generational update. So when you hear claims that a brand new chemistry will instantly replace everything, remember how car programs actually move. The next two years are far more likely to be a steady climb, cheaper packs, wider charging, smarter software, than a single dramatic switch. Drop-in sounds simple until you zoom in. A modern Tesla isn't designed around a generic rectangle called battery. The pack is part of the car's structure. It carries loads in a potential crash. It channels heat through carefully placed plates and coolant paths. It speaks a specific voltage language to inverters and safety systems. Change the chemistry and you change the rules those systems were built to follow. Start with structure. In models using a structural pack, the casing behaves like a floor and a brace. Swap that pack and you're not just trading modules, you're altering how forces travel through the body. That's a validation program, not a weekend upgrade. Next, thermal behavior. Each chemistry wants a certain temperature window and responds differently under fast charge. Cooling plates, sensors, and pump logic are tuned to that profile. If the pack stores and releases heat in a new way, the car needs new hardware and new software to keep it in the safe, efficient zone. Then the electronics. The battery management system isn't a universal translator. It's calibrated for a voltage window, cell count, and fault thresholds. A different chemistry can sit at a different nominal voltage and react differently under load. That touches inverters, contactors, charge curves, even the way the range estimate stabilizes after a fast session. You don't fix that with one firmware push. You confirm it with a test plan. Can packs be replaced? Absolutely. Approved packs within the family the car was designed for, done by trained techs, with the right seals, torques, and leak checks. That's routine service but a cross-chemistry swap that promises new range, new charging behavior, and the same safety envelope is a new product. 
New products leave a paper trail. Supplier contracts, certifications, manuals, training. If that trail isn't visible, it's probably not ready. That doesn't make upgrades impossible. It just means real upgrades arrive as official programs with clear parts, pricing, and coverage. When they do, you'll see the footprints before the fanfare. Speed sells, but batteries obey rules. A charger can advertise huge power, yet your car only accepts what the cells and cooling can handle. Charging starts fast when the pack is low, then eases off as voltage rises. Think sprint, then glide. That taper isn't stinginess. It protects lifespan and keeps performance consistent years from now. Temperature is the quiet gatekeeper. If the pack is cold, ions move sluggishly and resistance climbs. If it's hot, you risk stress. That's why preconditioning matters. The car warms or cools the pack on the way to a station so it can take a bigger gulp right off the bat. Even then, the sweet spot is a window, not a switch. Arrive warm and low on charge, and you'll see higher peaks for a short burst. Arrive at 55% on a winter morning, and the curve will look gentler. Hardware headlines can be misleading. A site rated for very high power doesn't guarantee your session will pin the meter. Passenger EVs are pack limited by design, and for good reason. Pushing maximum power for too long shortens life. Smart curves front load speed when it matters and taper to protect the pack. That's why zero to 80% in X minutes is always a range, shaped by state of charge, temperature, chemistry, iron versus nickel blends, and even how busy the site is. So what feels meaningfully faster in the real world? Better routing that steers you to open stalls. Wider rollout of next-gen cabinets so more cars hit their personal peak for that early window. Smarter thermal control so you land at the charger in the Goldilocks zone more often. Small wins, stack together, shave real minutes without trading away health. If you want practical speed today, use three simple habits. Arrive with a lower state of charge. Don't top off before a stop. Let the car precondition automatically and charge only to what you need to reach the next leg with a buffer. Leave the last 20% for your garage. On road trips, it's where time goes to fizzle out. Five-minute miracles make great thumbnails. Consistent, predictable sessions make great trips. The industry is quietly optimizing for the second one. The scary headline says fast charging will break the grid. The real story is timing not panic. Most EV energy is taken quietly at night on a schedule your car already knows. Off-peak hours are cheaper and calmer. Set a window and the car does the rest. Instead of millions of drivers gulping power at once, the load is spread across the hours when the grid has room to breathe. Public sites add another layer, local battery storage. Those cabinets charge when demand is low, then pour energy into cars when demand is high. Think of them as shock absorbers. You still connect to the grid, but the heavy lifting happens from a buffer on site, so a busy evening doesn't have to feel like a surge. Add smart software and stations can pace sessions, rotate peak power to the stalls that need it most, and keep lines moving without hammering the feeder. Utilities are nudging the system in the same direction. Time of use pricing makes late night electrons cheaper. Managed charging pilots let customers opt in so the utility can gently shift start times by a few minutes and flatten spikes without you noticing. Fleet depots do a version of this at scale, sequencing hundreds of vehicles, prioritizing the ones that need to roll first and soaking up midday solar when it's plentiful. Hardware helps too. Newer chargers are modular, so operators add capacity in steps instead of tearing everything out. If a corridor gets busy, they can drop in more cabinets, add site storage, or upgrade a transformer with a plan instead of guessing and overbuilding. The goal is simple. Make fast feel normal, not exceptional. For you, three habits keep the system and your trip smooth. One. Schedule home charging for off-peak hours and let the car precondition the pack before a stop. Two, 
arrive at public chargers lower and leave with what you need, not a perfect 100%. Three, favor sites that show live stall status. Even a short wait can vanish if the software routes you to the next open location. Will every region move at the same speed? No, some places will feel tight on hot evenings or holiday weekends, but the direction is clear. More storage, smarter timing, better software. The grid doesn't have to muscle every peak in real time when it can plan, buffer, and glide. Bidirectional is moving from demo to daily life. Cybertruck's PowerShare hints at Tesla's path. Wider support needs certified home hardware, utility programs, and clear safety standards. The upside is real. Keep essentials on during outages, send power back at peak for credits, and recharge off-peak. Your driveway becomes quiet energy capacity, not just transportation. When the pieces align, your car starts doing work. Energy is where massive shows up in the numbers. Megapacks sell by the acre, power walls stay in demand, software arbitrages cheap to peak electrons. Scaling storage and trimming LFP and 4680 costs deliver steadier margins than betting on an unproven chemistry. Cheaper variants come from supply chain leverage, not magic cells. Track deployments, cost per kilowatt hour, and charger permits, that's where strategy becomes visible. Thumbnails start the conversation, paper trails finish it. When a bold claim pops up, look for signals that don't care about hype. Tesla investor letters and SEC filings, factory and charger permits, supplier earnings calls and MOUs, service manual or parts catalog revisions, EPA and NHTSA databases, utility V2X pilots and published tariffs, UL and I triple E certifications, independent teardowns, and verified site photos. These are the breadcrumbs that precede real products. Quick filter for any claim. Where's the document? Who's the supplier and what did they confirm on their call? What hardware is physically shipping and to which facilities? Do regulators, utilities, or certification bodies acknowledge it? Are early users sharing consistent time-stamped data, charge curves, install reports, not just screenshots? Use thumbnails to find the topic. Use the paperwork to judge the timeline. That combo keeps you curious without getting carried away. Aluminum Ion is promising research, not a scheduled Tesla product. Over the next two years, the wins to watch are practical. Cheaper LFP and 4680 packs, wider V4 coverage, steadier charge curves, and storage-backed sites that feel faster without drama. Retrofits won't be magic modules. When upgrades arrive, they'll come as official programs with parts, pricing, and paperwork. Use thumbnails to discover ideas, then verify with documents, permits, supplier notes, manuals, and pilot data. That's how you separate a headline from hardware. So, what should you do today? If you own a Tesla, use scheduled charging, keep software current, and favor stations with live status. If you're shopping, compare total cost, not just range. Charging access, warranty, and resale often matter more than any single spec. And if you enjoy the tech journey, track filings and field results not rumors. If this helped, tap subscribe and drive safely torquers. See you next time.